I came across this amazing book um, called The Power of Play, Creativity and Tertiary Learning. Um, and one of the co-authors is Allison James. I'm going to see if I can paste this link to the book in here so y'all can see it. Um, and this book instantly grabbed my attention. I was just, I read it, I think in a day and there's just so many great ideas in it. Um, a bunch of different faculty came together to share things that they're doing in their classrooms. And it really was a pillar to kind of figuring out how to do this in my own teaching. So as we started creating <clears throat> this playposium, we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could get Allison James to be one of our keynote speakers? So we emailed her, she agreed, we met with her and here she is today. Um, and we are just so, so excited to have her here. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about her. These are just a few things. Um, she's a national teaching fellow. She's an accredited Lego serious play facilitator. And she's a speaker, writer, advisor, workshopper on all things in higher ed and play. And currently she's focusing on a massive research project on the value of play. And she'll kind of talk a little bit about that today. Um, so I will just turn it over to you. This is Alison James. Um, can everybody hear me now okay? Am I coming through okay? Fantastic. Um, I will be moving into kind of presentation mode to tell you a little bit about what I've been doing in a second. Um, but first of all, I wanted to do something with you um, that I hope uh, you will join me in. In the spirit of this conference, it is a total experiment because what I've, I'm about to do with you, I've only done with one other person before, and I'll tell you about that either. I know that sounds dodgy, but I promise you, this is entirely legitimate and academic. Um, so uh, hopefully you will have your videos on. Uh, if you don't want your video on, but you can see me and you still want to do uh, the activity, then that's absolutely fine. So what I will do is in a minute, I will ask you to uh, join me. And at the end, I will tell you when I finished. And then while you're sitting there thinking, what was that? I will get my slides up and we'll move back into some form of comfort zone. So what I would like you to do is a mirroring activity with me. I've only done this with one person. I haven't done it with a hundred and something people before. I don't even know if it will work, but let's give it a go. So I'm going to start moving my hands and I want you to mirror the action of my hands, wherever you are. So start following me now. Okay, thank you for doing that. I'm going to uh, call up my slides. Lisa, can you see my slides yet? No. Do I need to, is there, is there a share screen? I know I'm the co-host, but I can't see the share your screen button. Let's see here. If you move oh, the cursor, it should be. I found it, panic over. <laughs> Here we go. There's nothing, nothing like a, a bit of a bit of a technical hitch to, uh, to get you going. OK, thank you so much for doing that. Now, I don't know what it was like for you, but for me, it was fascinating because I could see along the gallery hands moving in unison with mine. And the reason that I wanted to start with that simple activity is because of this man. This is Stephen Nakmanovich, and he is the author of the two books that you can see on the screen, The Art of Is, oops, and uh, um, Free Play. And I interviewed Stephen as part of the research project that I'm going to talk about. And one of the things that had been really on my mind, because it was the kind of question that people kept bringing to me over the last eight or nine months, which is, 
how can you make maintain connection with your students when suddenly we, we are dispersed and we're separated and I said I asked him the question he just said well let's try this shall we and as you can see he did a mirroring activity with me in the course of our interview and I was completely transfixed and I thought there you are actually one-to-one -one, you still can connect without tech in very simple ways now whether or not that did it for you feel free to tell me in the chat uh, maybe it just felt a bit awkward but for me it was a really important uh, pointer that we can find all sorts of very simple ways and i think um wendy and michelle with their fantastic introduction today have already pointed to some of those things so i think we're going to have some repeat motifs uh, coming through the things that we discuss so my name's Alison, as uh, Lisa said, I'm a National Teaching Fellow, I'm a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy in the UK. I've headed up various uh, departments looking at academic development and learning and teaching over the course of my career. I've spent a lot of time in the creative arts, but also in multidisciplinary contexts as well. I'm also a keen mushroom forager in my um, spare time, photos not eating, and this particular visual from the Fondazione Prada did make me smile a lot in terms of how we play through our artworks. So uh, Lisa touched on the power of play, thank you for that Lisa, and I've done a lot of other work looking at creativity, imagination and play in higher education over the years, and I think the wonderful thing about this play posium is that we are part of an emerging uh, and an increasing avant-garde. Six, eight years ago, uh, there was very little going on in the way of play in higher education, for all sorts of reasons that we're probably aware of and I'll touch on. But um, it really is growing. There are networks, there are international groups springing up. Um, we are starting to find that people are taking play seriously. Not everybody, but enough people. And once we have these kind of critical masses, like all of us being together today, then we really do have the strength to be able to put a different kind of position when somebody says, oh, well, that's not proper academia though, is it? Don't even get me started on what proper academia is, but that, that can be a talk for another day. Um, in the course of my career, I also joined forces with colleagues at the University of Winchester in the UK. And uh, every year for three years, we ran a play and creativity festival, bringing academics, uh, professional services, uh, staff, porters, cooks, students, senior management, all together to play and create. And there is a link in the references uh, to this talk. So if you want to go and have a look at the blog and see the photos of what we did, our play tent, how it went down, what students said, there's lots of information there. So there's a bit of a history going on. And of course, because we're all here together today, we have already started to think about what play means in higher education. And we already know that it's much more than just something um, trivial. It's pre-cultural. If you've read uh, Johann Huysinger, he says, we, we, we know animals knew how to play long before we did. It's genetic. Many uh, um, animal behaviorists will argue that, that play is in our DNA. It's part of our human makeup. It's evolutionary, it's how we survive, it's how we thrive, it's how we develop in the face of adversity. It's instinctive and instinctual. We do it, we almost can't help ourselves from doing it. And I've now got my, um, I have my chat box over my, my clouds, so I sort of had to pause for a moment there. Now, if you've read Brian Sutton Smith, he wrote The Ambiguity of Play in 1997, and he really takes a deep dive, distilled from 40 years of play research into the ambiguity and the contradictions across play types. And he's one of the first people to say that it's incredibly hard to define what play is. So I'm not going to spend any time trying to do that because lots and lots of people have tried and failed. But we will be touching on aspects of play, obviously, throughout this, this talk. Play is complex, as we've already heard, incredibly complex. It's also contrary. Not everybody agrees about what is and isn't play. And it's contextual. So something that is ordinary in one context might be play in another and vice versa. We also know that play often has its special places like the magic circle or dedicated arenas or sports pitches or whatever. 
play is also highly subjective, hence the karaoke of my title. You know, as I said, if we were all together in a room, we could raise our hands and some people love being Gloria Gaynor and belting out, I will survive. And others, myself included, just think I am not going to inflict myself on humanity singing because that is just a crime. Um, it's affective. It is um, an emotional uh, engagement of all kinds of descriptions. And it's also connective. I've already talked about connection from the get-go, and this is something that's coming through very strongly in my own research, but also through my own experiences of teaching and researching with play. Now, play is everywhere, as we already know. But the interesting thing, and, and Lisa has touched on this already, is that in HE, it, it's valued by some of us, clearly that's why we're here today, but sometimes it's undervalued, it's not really grasped, people have a, a very superficial understanding of what it is, and they certainly don't necessarily understand what it's doing in a higher education context, so of course we are all together because we know better, go us. So. Obviously, I think we've probably all at some point in our lives thought this is the easiest definition of play we can come up with. But we also know that there are many, many far deeper um, uh, illustrations of what play can mean. And I did say I wasn't going to define it, but I am going to share these two definitions of play that I think really speak to me. And this one by Miguel Sicard, I find particularly powerful. To play is to be in the world. Playing is a form of understanding what surrounds us and who we are and a way of engaging with others. Play is a mode of being human. And alongside that, I've taken, I think, from Friedrich Schiller, but I can't remember, Pat Kane, taking reality lightly, all you have to do is think about the humour of the police, the fire brigade, soldiers, doctors, nurses, any of us who've been in a tight spot or a dangerous spot, play is how we actually deal with some of the uh, most powerful existential threats that we come across. Now, nothing more existential for us, perhaps, or I mean, there will have been all sorts of awful things going on in this year, but a global pandemic certainly is, 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 is it beats the band. And it's something that I've noticed through play, we have both made and broken connection, or the pandemic has broken connection in our human relationships, whether we're educators, whether it's in our family lives, our working arrangements, our, our, our political setups, our societal connections, our ability to travel, whatever. Um, and talk about taking reality lightly, here's this rather dark um, illustration of the rats um, finding all the disposable face masks that have just been littered all over the UK. It's a British joke, but I imagine that it travels. Um, so a little bit of uh, liberty taking here with uh, some really key literature. Um, I would like you to think, and again, going back to what Michelle and Wendy were saying about, you know, whizzing through activities, this is a, a high speed train ride through my slides to make sure I stay to time. But what I'm going to ask you to think about next, I'll do quite quickly, but they are things that you can elaborate and turn into an activity of your own as well. And I like you to think about how did you play if you've been in lockdown in any form or any other kind of pandemic experience you've had, how have you played? Has it changed from the ways that you usually play? Think on that for a second or two. Then my next question, why did you choose these forms of play? Was it expedient? Was it because you couldn't do other things? Was it because it spoke to you? Was it because you had a different kind of need? And what did you value in the way you played? You may not have intended it at the outset, but after playing, what was it that made you think, oh, I got that out of that form of playing? obviously not necessary in a much more visceral way rather than that kind of rather intellectualized consideration of our experience. And also, what have you noticed about the different kinds of play taking place around you, wherever you've been, whatever context you've been in? So just some examples, again, uh, partly from the UK, but from elsewhere. 
So in the north of England, we had some runners who used to go jogging around their, their local neighborhood. But in fact, they, know, they knew that there were so many children and elderly people who were shielding or who were locked inside, who couldn't get outside. They donned their Spider-Man outfits and they turned into local heroes because they were running around. The people who were shut indoors had the opportunity to see these guys go by. And it was connection. It was waving. It was humor. It was playing with the day to day. Now, you might have tried to buy a jigsaw puzzle, which you probably thought was only for your grandma, but suddenly no jigsaw puzzles are cool, but you can't buy any because literally everybody is doing jigsaw puzzles. And again, we're starting to, to parody our artworks in our jigsaw puzzles. We're bringing reality darkly and lightly, even into the games that we make. Loads of AI, VR, digital gaming going on. Um, on a personal note, April 3rd was my wedding anniversary. We couldn't get out to buy cards or anything. And so I created a scavenger hunt in the garden for my husband and he upended the fruit and vegetables and made me a happy anniversary table. Um, I don't think this is just in the, in the States or in the UK, it's probably elsewhere, but loads of people decided buying inflatable dinosaur outfits was a really good thing to do when you're going to the supermarket for shopping. Now, some of them genuinely believe that this was uh, protective clothing. Others just thought this will give other shoppers a laugh. And here again from the north of England, because clearly they're funny in the north of England, um, after a while you start noticing antisocial behaviours and the usual kind of social tellings off or the, the billboards saying do this and don't do that aren't working in the same way. And so people are starting to inject a kind of slightly more savage humour. Um, I don't know if the word tossa translates um, uh, across the Atlantic. Um, apologies if it sounds ruder than it's meant to be, but it's, it's not a compliment. Um, but certainly, you know, litter dropping has been one of the things that has really, really incensed many people uh, as everybody converges on the natural environment. And so here was just another illustration of how we are playing with the predicament that we find ourselves in. And if you're anything like me, probably one of the things you've spent most of your lockdown time or your pandemic time doing is deleting emails from Groupon. But even in your Groupon emails, these funny plays mocking the circumstances that we find our, ourselves in have crept into our emails. And this one was really important. No dogs were harmed in the making of this slide, incidentally, because People and animals can't play if they're stressed. It comes through all the play theory. It comes through animal behavioral studies. It comes through anthropology. We can't do it. All you have to think about is when you're uptight, that's when your sense of humor goes. That's when you don't feel as carefree. And we'll look at some examples of that going on. And that's a really, really important reason why play is so fundamental to every aspect of what we do. Now, Seth and Smith went a little further, and this was in his uh, work that was um, written in his lifetime, but not completed, and it was published posthumously and edited, um, uh, published by The Strong, actually, um, a nod to Debbie there. Uh, and Sutton Smith said that plays positive pleasure typically transfers to our feelings about the rest of our everyday existence and makes it possible to live more fully in the world, no matter how boring or painful or even dangerous ordinary reality might seem. And just to illustrate that, I've been looking, I'm a professional coach as well, and I've been looking at a great uh, uh, different range of source materials, looking at people's strategies for navigating life, whether it's through play or through other means. And in their book, Finding Peace in a Frantic World, Mark Williams and Danny Penman shared this example of some research conducted at the University of Maryland in 2001. And there some students were given a maze puzzle to do. They were split into two groups. One group uh, was guiding a mouse to the, uh, the mouse hole and there was a lovely piece of cheese by the mouse hole. And the other group of students were guiding the mouse to the mouse hole, but there was an owl hovering, uh, uh, waiting to predate the mouse. So puzzles done very quickly by both groups of students, but immediately afterwards, the students were also invited to take part in a test of their creativity. 
And what was really interesting was that the mice who had had the cheese in their puzzle had been working unbeknownst to them with a positive um, model and the owl students had been working with avoidance strategy and it was the students who'd worked with the positive model the cheese who were 50 percent more creative than those who had worked with the owl they were happy they were carefree they were they were happy to experiment they were playful they were joyful whereas those who worked the owl were uh, hyper vigilant they were much more cautious and they were less ready to take risks and so the, one of the lessons that was taken from this research was that actually it's the state of mind in which you do something that is almost as important as the thing that you do. And that's very important when we think about play, because sometimes we are very playful and we won't, won't necessarily be doing something that is a play activity as such. But the way that we are doing it makes it so. And it is that part of sort of boundary blurring. And uh, the writers go on to talk about the power of the avoidance strategy and how it does dampen the human spirit. And they came up with this wonderful phrase, which is that if you get too trapped in the avoidance mindset, your playfulness becomes paved with concrete. And I felt that was an incredibly powerful way of expressing the danger. So pandemic or not, online, offline, whatever, students and staff, we want the same thing. We don't want to be bored. We want to connect. We want to communicate. We want to interact. We want to be inspired. We want to do the tough stuff, play, and our best modes of learning and teaching aren't about um, having a bit of light relief after we've done the important or the grown-up stuff. They're one and the same thing. We want to be able to try and fail and try again and then get it right. We also want to be understood, supported. We want to be fascinated and curious and have a sense of wonder. And we want to develop and progress. And one of my interviewees said that the problem with play, and this was in one of my interviews, he said, the thing is, play has a bad rap. Play is seen as a peccadillo rather than pedagogy. And I said, I'm nicking that. And he said, you're welcome. But it's really important that we understand that play is no different as a teaching strategy than, than our lectures, our seminars, our use of PowerPoints, whatever it is. They are all tools and approaches and we can do them well or we can do them badly. This I love, again, came through in another interview. Play is about building a mindset. It's transformative. It's about giving students the chance to see that from play comes great thinking and freedom and you get a chance to experiment. Now, one of the reasons that we are probably all here today and that we love play or creative or innovative approaches to teaching and learning is because as teachers and educators, we are magpies. We are looking for something that is going to be different, something that will energize us as well as our students. Now, the problem with something like play and mag magpies, by the way, are, are very misunderstood birds. They get a very bad press. And there's been recent research that says, you know, people say that magpies are thieves. They just get they just want to steal shiny things. But actually, that's not true. Magpies are curious. So if they have interesting things, they won't necessarily go for the shiny trinket. They will go for something that has caught their imagination. And we're the same as teachers. Play is not the shiny trinket. Play is something that we have a deeper engagement with. Now, why are people playing? And I put in brackets in higher education, but actually this is why people are playing full stop. And the first one I really, really like. People are playing as acts of subversion. You think about the memes, the jokes, the gifts, the tweets, uh, the cartoons that go around. We take something that is serious and we undermine it, we unpick it. To fight the formula, this notion of the formula came over many times across my interviewees who said, Students and, and my colleagues, they want a formula, they want a recipe. Students want to say, oh, you know, in order to be a physiotherapist, for example, I want the formula, I want to know what to do in this case, that case. And of course, we're always working in, in our daily lives with partial information. We don't always have the formula, the recipe, the, the thing that you follow step by step so that you don't get it wrong. And it's about difficulty and tension and feeling good and all these kinds of things. And these come through very much in the work that Sutton Smith did as well. 
And this, I think, is also really important, especially for what we're thinking about today, because all our, our approaches are legitimate, whether we're looking for the quick play activity or something far greater. But I love how this person said, play is like big data. It's the big value in terms of approach, because actually it's not necessarily about breaking everything down and saying we can put some play in there. It can be that, and sometimes it needs to be that. But I think for me, having a playful philosophy is an important place to start. And I get the sense already that actually all of us here today, we're already there. We have that playful philosophy. We might be thinking about how can we uh, fit in a quick bit of play, but it's bigger than that. So very quickly, to tell you a little bit about my research, and I won't go into it in any great detail, but I can bore for Britain on this subject. So if you want to know more, and I will be writing it up in a major report in 2021, so it will all be uh, coming out and freely available to everybody anyway. So it's a two year project. It's been funded by the Imagination Lab Foundation based in Lausanne. Uh, I don't benefit from uh, the funding in any way other than it makes um, it makes my, my ability to research uh, financially possible, um, but obviously I don't get paid a wage or whatever, and that doesn't matter at all. It's, it's, um, it's an absolute honour to be able to do this. And their fascination is with those intersections between the arts, science, humanities, business, play, imagination. And so there are four key sort of, sort of things that I'm looking at through this research, and they're not mutually exclusive, they are all part of the same discussion. I wanted funds to be able to go on looking at the different examples of play and playful learning around the world to build on what Christy and I and colleagues had already discovered through printing the power of play and through a whole range of other collaborations we've been involved in. As a funding body, there was a particular interest there in how play was being used to teach management theories and concepts. Um, and that was great because I was already gathering a whole heap of examples around that, but I knew it didn't exclude all the other things I wanted to look at from arts to zoology. So that was great. For me personally, I've been fascinated by the notions of value um, in operation with regards to play in higher education. And that might be value for the individual, for the student, within the discipline, within the department, within the institution, within the sector. It's massive and beyond that. And of course, sometimes those value systems really synchronise and sometimes they really butt heads. And because I've been particularly uh, influenced by Sutton Smith's work, um, although I've drawn on a whole range of, of play theorists, not just him, I wanted to think about the seven rhetorics of play that he elucidated in 1997. He doesn't really talk about higher education. So um, what, what can we say about higher education in relation to the seven rhetorics? And do we need other rhetorics? Is there everything that we want to say in about higher education? Does it fit under the ones that already exist? Now that's that's work that I am still elaborating, but it still it still fascinates me. So very quickly, and sorry about sort of the the dense text. I know that's a PowerPoint. No, no, but forgive me. Um, I was going to be uh, traveling a great deal, doing play workshops all over everywhere. And obviously COVID-19 put pay to that, no surprise there then. So instead I quickly launched an online survey and I carried out a whole heap of one-to-one um, -one interviews around people's play practices. So um, my data is based on 112 uh, responses from the survey, 57 interviews, but I also conducted a whole heap of other interviews. I've been involved in webinars, projects, conversations, teaching, and a whole heap of other things besides. Plus, I've been drawing on the academic literature and connection around play for many years now. And as you can see from this slide, respondents come from all around the world and they're in all sorts of roles. So I'll come back to some of the things that I've been pulling out of that, but I just want to quickly pause and say a little bit about Sutton Smith. So his notion of the seven rhetorics of play was really to elucidate the seven archetypal ideologies or belief systems that are expressed by play theorists when they are talking about the importance, the purpose, the function of play. Um, and they are quite distinctive, but equally they also do intermingle, interrelate, contradict each other. And he's also, 
you know, he's the first person to say, you know, it's almost impossible to define play uh, and it's an incredibly complex phenomenon. So you have to draw on a whole heap of different perspectives. If I'm a psychologist, I might have one perspective on play. If I'm a sociologist, another, an anthropologist, a historian, um, you know, whatever. We all bring the, 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 the markings and the belief systems of our disciplines, of our professions, of our conditioning, wherever that's come from. So these are the seven rhetorics. And I'll just quickly skip through those in terms of how they, um, how they connect on a very superficial level with what we're about in higher education. And I must say, health warning here, anything I say now about the seven rhetorics, they are complicated. So please don't walk away from this talk thinking, oh, she's missed some of the difficult bits about that because I simply haven't got the time to explain them in any detail. So one of the rhetorics is the rhetoric of face, fate, you know, being in the lap of the gods, the role of the dice, chance, the, um, the universe that is, you know, operating uh, either to its own rules or in a sense of, of chaos. Um, doesn't really take much effort to think about events being beyond our control this year and how we've had to sort of cope with them to think about where a rhetoric of fate might come in. Perhaps most familiar in higher education is this notion of the progress rhetoric, because we're all about learning and development, moving forward, getting better at something, um, always being on a, a lifelong or a life-wide uh, learning journey. Quick, sorry, quick sip of tea here while I um, have a pause. The other thing, and I again, we can conjure so many different things of where we can see play as an expression of power. Um, all we have to think about is if we think of the tussle, say, between the theoreticians that believe that play is only play if there's no, no harm, no unkindness, no meanness, and then another school of play theoreticians who say, you look at war games, you look at the boardroom, you look at bullying, you look at harassment, you look at uh, some of the more unattractive uh, forms of behaviour, and that is play, but it's the dark side of play, it's the mean side of play. Play is often used as a means of expressing the collective bond, the collective identity, whether it's in our little village fate or uh, at, a, at a football match with our team or, or maypole dancing or setting on fireworks or whatever it is. Also, and, and, and Sutton Smith divides the rhetorics between what he calls the ancient and the modern rhetorics, and he's keen to point out that this notion of play as identity, as a means of reflecting on our own experiences and being something that is important for the value we get out of that experience, is a very modern rhetoric, whereas something like the rhetoric of fate is an ancient one. Our artists, our sculptors, our writers, our poets are often those who uh, conjure play through the imaginary as a fanciful response to reality. And then, of course, there's the nonsense makers, the fools that speak truth to power, escape or diversion or nonsense frivolity, throwing things up in the air, deconstructing things, making, making a mockery of things as a means of, of playing, but playing with what we take to be the norms. And I'd like just to play a little bit with this here. So I want you to have a look at this item here and have a think about what you think it is. And you might be having other th thoughts in your head, like, is it big? Is it little? Uh, what's it on? So I'll let you into a secret. This is uh, a Father's Day chocolate. Um, this was a source of great play in the family because my, my husband got lots of very, very exotic Father's Day chocolates, but he wasn't eating them fast enough. So I thought I'd help him. And um, this is one of the remaining, actually it's not a remaining because I ate this one too. But this chocolate um, I picked up the other day and I thought, just like we do when we pick up any object or an item that is around us, um, this is something that we can see beyond. Yes, literally, it's a chocolate. It's made of this stuff. But if I look at it, could it be other things? Could it actually, if I was flying a drone, could I be looking at a little island with huts with red roofs? 
Could I be looking at a place that's covered in snow? Could I be looking at a gas tower? Could I be looking at some horrible biological experiment? So it takes little, nothing for us to find an object next to our computers, in our handbags, on our tables, and quickly turn that into some kind of symbol or some kind of activity. And what I'd like you to do, and I'm only going to give you about 15 seconds, because as we know, we're all against the clock, is just turn, just look around you. What is next to your, your desk right now that you could pick up and turn into a symbol or use as a teaching tool that isn't anything to do with your teaching at all? Now, this is where I really miss being in a room with everybody, because then we would be able to have a conversation about what you picked up, why you picked it up, what you're going to do with it. But I would lay a wager that whatever your background, whatever it was that you picked up, you would find a way of making that have a connection with whatever it is that you do or you teach. Now, I'm a little bit, I am um, using a, a stop um, a stop clock, um, but I, I'm, I'm a little bit confused between the Denver clock and my clock, so I'm not sure if I've got six minutes or longer to talk, but I will speed up a little bit, and, um, and then if I've got a few minutes at the end, so much the better. So, very quickly though, let's take the chocolate as, again, a form of play, and I've already said very firmly that Sutton Smith's arguments behind each of these, uh, these rhetorics are infinitely more detailed than I'm doing them justice. So what I'm about to do is total heresy, but never mind. So let's try and illustrate with this chocolate. Fate, chocolate will get me through our tussles with the difficult universe. Progress, I'm going to make new kinds of chocolate. Power, contest, my chocolate's better than your chocolate. Chocolate defines us. If you were a chocolate, what would you be? Here's my haiku, all about chocolate. Chocolate for president. Anyway, moving swiftly on. So when we look at the rhetorics, they are present in all sorts of conceptions of the value of player in higher education that are coming through my research currently. And you will, um, when you get the chance uh, to watch this again, if you're minded to, have more time to kind of go through all of these things. But I would imagine these you would certainly expect to see in terms of play. Progress, navigating relationships, relaxing people, having fun, bonding, but perhaps it's more of a surprise to find that interviewees and survey respondents were saying play is really important in higher education for these things. Imagination and fantasy, not just the literature teachers people, the scientists as well. Allowing for and exploring frivolity, disorder and nonsense. Can you believe it was a military educator who said to me, I'm never going to say to a three-star general, I'm using play, but actually, yes, there should be a place for this in military education. And People, when I, I just threw out there, I said, what about survival? Is play important for survival in higher education? Fully expecting people to say, don't be silly, this is a university. And 50% of my respondents came back and said, yes, it's really important. And the reason it's important, as Sutton Smith argues, is that it has a cultural aspect. Our, our play, play predicaments, if you like, model our struggle for survival and that we are searching for safety, approval, achievement, love, and even significance. Now, if you think about our students, it's not too much of a push to think that our students are looking for exactly that at university. Now, you know, not all of those will come through the curriculum, but it's really important that we recognize they're there. Types of play, loved this bit of my research, saying to people, what are you using? What are you doing? What sorts of play? And here, are so many different kinds of play. You'd expect to find things like card games, board games, digital play, uh, perhaps theater, but theater in the teaching of surgery, magic tricks to teach finance, fantasy play, parody and pretend, animal play, sheepdog training for when you're teaching leadership and so on and so forth. So we are out there in our forms of play, um, which is wonderful to see. Now, quite often what people have said to me over the last nine months is, 
whatever my institution thinks, and my institution may be saying, just shove the information up on the virtual learning environment, and at least that way the students have got what they need. Well, we know that content isn't the only thing. That's why we're here. And so we want and we need to play with our students, but we don't always know how, which is why a day like today is so valuable. Now, some people just don't know how to play or they think it's about being awkward or, or being silly or doing something that they don't feel comfortable with. We have to find our own ways to play, because if we aren't all right with it, then probably nobody else will be either. Now, there are barriers to play. We've probably come across them in one form or another. People will deride it. They'll say, as uh, somebody did in a, a top flight research university when I went to do a play workshop, I really liked it. I've got colleagues who really wanted to come today, but they didn't dare because they were afraid they wouldn't be seen as serious academics. You might get disrespect, people just uh, dismissing what you do. It might be that people feel uncomfortable, or even if they're not uncomfortable, they fear being uncomfortable. It's not planned well, therefore it doesn't work, therefore everybody gets the minimum out of it. Uh, misunderstanding, doing, you know, not realising really what's going on with the play or just managing it badly. So some of those things can be the, the problem of a person who is trying to introduce play without really thinking about what's going on. It does need proper planning. Um, but sometimes it's just the preconceptions that people have. And this is really striking, again, an interviewee from my research who described being in, um, in an interview situation where they'd actually done a micro teach as part of the interview application. They'd uh, shared their play practices. It had been fantastically well received by the students. And this slightly snipey comment about, I can see how it would make you popular, but where's the real learning? And that's really something that we've got to guard against because that, that, that's, that's the dark side coming through. So we've got institutional strategies for play, we've got individual ones, and I'm going to completely counter through these because I've now um, pressed the wrong button on my, um, my, my, my speedometer or whatever you want to say. So I don't even know if I've gone over time, but I really pray I haven't for everybody else. There's loads we can do, and we're doing it already with today. Create a play culture, make space to play come up with the arguments against negativity. This one, loads of people are doing this, want to do this, research it, because it's through our research as well as our academic practice that we legitimate, that we have the answer, that we can turn around and say, this does work, playful research works. Being open to different ways of playing, being fearless, having the nerve to stand up and say, this is all right. Joining global networks, not buying into the metrics agenda that says, oh, but if I can't measure it, then, it, you know, I can't prove that it's good. Nonsense. And individual strategies, very quickly. Online, offline, we don't have to make it big and complicated. We can do a little bit here, a little bit there. We can pick up the stuff around our computers. Points already been made, we can send students around their houses, around the campus, do whatever, whatever the constraints are upon us. We are not replicating. We're going to find different ways when we have to teach the way we're teaching now. What can people do by themselves? Do they need us to tell them how to do it? What free ideas can we get? We've got some cracking ideas today already, and we are going to get way more in the rest of the day. Can we get card things and turn them online? Can we make our own? What can students do? And what can students do with social media, just as we've already seen with the resources that were demonstrated in the icebreakers? Can we, can we get things physically to students? Can we co-create with students? Can we set play as part of assessment? What about solo play, not just collective play? What about free play? Stephen's books that I showed you right at the beginning of this talk are all about free play, not about structured or purposeful or measurable outcome play. Can you gamify your VLE? Now, some people want to shoot me for using the word game, gamify because they will say I'm about game based learning, but gamification that actually undermines the serious principles of higher education. That's another conference in itself. Theatre at a distance. I've had colleagues saying that they've done themed dress ups for their classes in Zoom uh, with their students. 
what else can we find that's out there? Going back to our magpies. And here's my top recommendation for you, Circe, based at uh, British Columbia, at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. Now, Gillian Johnson, who's their director, she is having the same fight with imagination as we are having with play, which is that it is an extraordinarily powerful tool to advanced learning, but it's not always understood by everybody. And finally, and this really is my final comment from Pat Kane in The Play Ethic. We need to realise that it's the richness and variety of our human games which make for a healthy and vibrant society. We need to become literate in all the forms of play that humans pursue. This can help us to describe our civilizations better and then begin to prescribe some of the directions they should be heading in. Thank you very much. My name's Alison. I would love to talk to you more about play. Thank you so much, Allison. That was amazing. I'm really glad we're recording this because there's so much that I want to go back and look at again. So thank you so much. Um, I'm also looking forward to the um, write-up of the research you're doing. It sounds fantastic.